Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on how is your organization dealing with vaccination among your workforce, policies, procedures, and practices. I'm Kim Bond. I'm an executive vice president here at Open Minds, and I'm so happy to be hosting this executive roundtable as we hear from some really interesting women and their agencies on how they've done the vaccination, kind of bringing their staff back, and how they're handling all those things. Um, so let me first introduce our panelists. We've got Christy Dougherty, who is from Emergence Health Network out of El Paso, Ashley Sandoval, her Associate Chief Executive Officer, also from Emergence Health, and then Jen Zajcek from Mosaic out of Nebraska. So we're glad to have you all with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. There you go. So our agenda today, we're really going to hope this ends up being a, a, a conversation between all of us. But first, we're going to hear a little bit from Emergence Health and let them tell us a little bit about their agency and how they've been working with their vaccinated and unvaccinated staff and coming back there. Um, then we're gonna go back, we're gonna head over to Mosaic and hear about Mosaic and their efforts and what they've done with their staff, vaccinated, not vaccinated, some of the trials and tribulations there. And then we're just gonna enter into this roundtable discussion and talk about the policies and procedures, practices, um, leadership challenges, budget impacts, lessons learned, and that's where we're going to be have this conversation going on. Any time during this presentation or our discussions, if you have a question, please look over in the questions box there. Just enter your question and we'll be happy to bring it into the conversation. Make sure your question gets addressed as we move forward. Now, as we enter this and why we all thought this was an important topic to cover was because well, as it says, it says here, several months since the first COVID vaccine was administered in the United States, more and more people getting vaccinated. And now that we're starting to go back into the workplace and we have this um, combination probably of staff, leadership who have been vaccinated and not vaccinated, we just want to have that discussion on what has been the lessons learned, what have been the successes, the challenges, and how can we all do this, learn from each other as we go forward in this unusual time um, as we're going through this. Okay, let's go to our next. So let's go first to Jen, you want, I mean, sorry, to Christy and Ashley. Do you want to start telling us about Emergence Health? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Kim. We're really happy to be here today and uh, appreciate you guys, let, let, Open Minds, letting us share our story. Uh, my name is Christy Darty. I am the CEO for Emergence Health Network in El Paso, Texas. If we can get the next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about us. We are a local mental health authority in El Paso County, and we have services for, um, uh, mental illness, developmental disabilities, as well as substance abuse. Uh, we have 19 locations. El Paso has about 850,000 uh, people in our community, but we are a border city. And so we have a very porous border. Any given day, there's a million or more people in El Paso. Um, we serve around 15,000 clients a year and have 630 employees. We're really happy to be celebrating our 55th anniversary. So uh, we are the largest outpatient structure in El Paso County. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, then. Thanks. All right, great. So what we wanted to do today is we really are excited about how our vaccination initiative has rolled out. Um, it's been very successful in, in our opinion. Uh, what we did, uh, we ourselves did not receive the vaccine. Um, there were some challenges through our pharmacy. So we, what we did is we partnered in our community. And I think the main success I'd like to, to recognize my community for is our staff was immediately, I mean, as soon as the, the pandemic hit uh, and the, the county judge issued a, this, the first stay at home order, our staff was listed as essential. So when that happened, that really, you know, it removed a lot of barriers that I know some of my colleagues have faced with regards to accessing that tier, that tier one A priority. So with our partners in the community, we ended up uh, being able, our initial wave, we were able to vaccinate about 420 staff out of the 630. And then we just added about 50 more. So that puts us at about a 75% vaccination rate, but it really is because of that designation and our key partners, our county hospital, our, our uh, medical school, uh, being able to offer our staff that vaccine. We had staff vaccinated within the first three days of the vaccine hitting El Paso. What we did in, in preparation is we had our chief nursing officer go through each of our employees, or our, excuse me, our job descriptions, and make sure we prioritized folks uh, on based on level of exposure. 
So um, even though all of our organization was essential, we internally tiered our own staff. Uh, again, making the, the coordination between our um, human resource uh, department and our agency partners. So we would do all the footwork for, this, for the uh, employee, which allowed us to, uh, I apologize, which allowed us to um, uh, get folks in and out very quickly. And then we, I think we're going to talk about this a little later, but we did have, we created policies. Uh, we have a complete bridge back plan and we're working. Um, what we did is we have a, our CMO of primary care. He was on call uh, and available via phone call for every employee that got the vaccine. If they had any adverse reactions, they could call him immediately. They didn't have to wait and make an appointment, go to an emergency room, unless of course they, we did send them out um, information that if they had certain symptoms, they needed to immediately go to the hospital. So I'm gonna uh, go ahead and kick it over to Ashley to talk about some of the challenges that we face. Next slide. Yeah, thank you, Christy. <clears throat> thank you. Some of the challenges that um, we have today and, and they're ever changing, right? So um, we listed three here that we can think of right away, but um, initially, as Christy mentioned, although we got the majority of our employees vaccinated, um, we had a really good buy-in there. We still have obviously those that are not vaccinated, we have their dependents, and then we also have um, you know, our patients that are not vaccinated. So, um, or we don't know, I should say, we don't know the amount that are vaccinated at this point. So really we're looking at, you know, how do we plan for new and onboarding employees? Um, you know, for example, there's a lot out there on, you know, do we begin showing proof to our human resources department for new employees, um, showing their vaccine card that they did receive it? you know, what tracking mechanisms can we have in place um, to make sure that we're, we're keeping a close eye on, you know, all of our employees. And then the other part is once we start um, bridging back to the office uh, <clears throat> a little bit more in a hybrid model, and then once we're officially all in together is more, how do we start to identify those that are vaccinated versus those who are not? Um, you know, there's been <clears throat> examples out there about, um, you know, employers using their ID badges uh, to, you know, indicate who has been vaccinated versus who has not. Um, you know, so it's, it's really thinking along those lines, because obviously, even though we're vaccinated, we still, uh, as a group, have to take into uh, consideration certain precautions that are out there through the CDC. Uh, another thing, you know, that kind of goes in the same line is, you know, bridging back to the office um, with employees that are vaccinated versus not. You know, it's it's really taking into consideration um, what has been a challenge for us is testing. So, you know, testing was something that when the pandemic started, if somebody was potentially exposed, you know, you would test the whole group, um, anybody that was around there in quarantine and follow those uh, protocols. But now that you have vaccinated individuals in, in the office, your considerations are a little bit different. Um, the CDC has put out there and then we have uh, information from our chief medical officer that will tell you you know, you, you don't necessarily have to test even those that are vaccinated, you just have to identify those that are not. Um, so that's also been kind of a challenge to communicate to employees because I think they feel safer um, just having the test even though they've been vaccinated. So trying to work through those kinks and, um, you know, it, it's, it's just admitting that we don't have all of the knowledge in place, but based on what we know through the CDC, this is what we can offer them. Um, and then moving into the last one, as I just mentioned, CDC guidelines are changing, um, you know, every day. And so it's um, super important for us as executives to constantly be um, keeping up with the information that is being pushed out. And typically, um, if I have an employee asking me questions, I will bring up the CDC on screen with them to encourage them to do the same. Uh, because I feel like, you know, information is power. So you know, although we have great staff like our chief medical officer, our chief nursing, uh, chief nursing officer in-house that can help guide, uh, it's equally as important that we all be as knowledgeable as, as, as we can be. Um, but those are some of the challenges that we, you know, have in our minds today. Thank you so much. And then this is all the information if you want to get in touch or look, check out Emergence Health. Fantastic. There's so many good ideas. I've, I've been writing down questions and thoughts that when we get to our conversation, I want to follow up on. So thank you both, Christy and Ashley. I really, really appreciate your time. Okay, next for Jen. Tell us all about Mosaic. Hi, everyone. So my name is Jen Zychak, and I am the Vice President of Operational Excellence with Mosaic. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, Mosaic is, next slide. Uh, so Mosaic is the, um, uh, can you go to the next slide for me, please? One more. Or I'll just, you just have to hear me talk. Okay, there we go. So um, you guys can read it anyway, but uh, Mosaic is a whole health, a whole person healthcare organization reaching across 13 states. We provide services to about 5,600 people um, over a pretty large geographical area. Um, our services empower people with disabilities, mental and behavioral health needs, autism, um, as well as seniors. Um, and we are uh, affiliated with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and we're a nonprofit 5013C. So that's kind of our demo graphics. Next slide, please. Um, some of the challenges that we had that I think are a, a bit different than we maybe heard Christy and Ashley talk about, um, certainly our workforce vaccination strategies was up front and center, but we also really had strategies around folks that we provide services to um, in group homes, in their own apartments, in a host home model. So it was a um, really a combined effort of trying to figure out when the, when the vaccinations would be available, who they were available to. Um, and the challenge of 13 states, um, and sometimes even within states, different counties right next to each other, having different interpretations of who fell into which phase, those sorts of things. So uh, when the pandemic started, Mosaic created a COVID core team. Um, our national office is in Omaha, Nebraska, and we have agencies that we support across our 13 states. So we created a, a centralized COVID core team that really created operational guidance based on CDC and WHO um, um, facts to really create that guidance for our residential services, our workforce. We have both employee and contractor models. Um, we felt that was something that as an organization, creating some resources and guidance, that was uh, a real benefit that we had. Uh, it was a real game changer when it came to vaccination strategies when each state and each county had a different approach to that. So that was really one of the um, bigger challenges that we had. We couldn't do as much or provide the same type of support um, to the rest of the Mosaic network. We really had to rely on our local leaders to advocate with their um, state public health or their local public health or local pharmacies to um, create create those opportunities for vaccinations. And in some cases, uh, people served were in phase 1C and their staff were in phase 1A and there was just a lot of um, coordination to figure out, I mean, bottom line, we want folks to be able to get their vaccinations, but then what does that mean if we have different people in different phases? How do we get them there and, and those sorts of things? Um, as many of us experienced when the vaccination first came out, there was a lot of noise, if you will, around the vaccine. So it was a very interesting time in our, our pandemic with that. And there was a lot of hesitancy for folks to get the, the vaccine, not only within our workforce, but as um, people served as well, um, or the families of folks served because of you know, it was an unknown, it's new, kind of all those sorts of things. So figuring out how to wade um, through the vaccination hesitancy was one of the first challenges that we had. So not only across 13 states, what's the, what does the game look like in that state and what are the rules? Um, how do we um, advocate for folks who, they may have an opportunity to go get vaccinated, but they're terrified or there are unknowns or those sorts of things. So some of the strategies that we implemented really um, came down to a, a couple of main things. First of all, information is, is power. And I think Ashley you know, referenced that a little bit as well. People have questions. And that was one way that our COVID core team at the national office could support our agencies to just gather facts. Here are the FAQs, here are the side effects, here's you know, here's what the Pfizer looks like, here's what Moderna looks like, and really create some resources for folks. Um, we did that through, um, 
email. We did it through a question and answer kind of questionnaire that folks could um, uh, write into, email into the agency and have their personal questions answered, those sorts of things. We also found that the ability for one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and mostly their direct support supervisor were the most effective things. They just wanted to have somebody to talk through what their concerns were. And in some cases, they wanted two or three or four people to talk through what their concerns were um, to either match what they're hearing on the news or counter what they might be seeing on Facebook or you know wherever social media was causing some of those questions or contributing to some of those because it was so new at the time. Uh, we did find that those individual conversations were the most effective um, and really having leaders step up to kind of be the first in line, which um, feel kind of weird about because if you have a leader, none of us want to feel like we're taking a potential vaccination away from our direct support staff, but we also saw the benefit if your supervisor is willing and able to get their vaccine and they go first to help allay some of your fears, that uh, we've had managers who videotaped their entire first shot vaccination, sent an email to their staff, here's what my side effects are, there were really none of them. A lot of those personalized strategies really helped to reduce that hesitancy. And remember, this was like December and January when it was first coming out. Obviously, it's well, it's April today, and our vaccination process across the country is in a different place that it was even then. But there was just there was a, a lot of hesitancy at the time. So the local efforts by our agencies, the one-on-one -on -one conversations, and that's really mirrored as well with the people that we support and their guardians is just getting your questions answered. Although we found um, at Mosaic that it was really oftentimes more our workforce that was hesitant. Most of the time, the people that we support were like, I'm first in line, I'm cutting ahead because I wanna get my life back, let me get this vaccine and um, let's let's wrap this thing up. So um, it was it was fun to see the, the excitement from, from folks serve, but it created opportunities as well. So in addition to our vaccination strategies, it really, um, because again, we're across such a wide geographical area, it hosting clinics became a bit of a logistical um, dance, if you will, to not only find the space, find the pharmacy to work with, get people signed up. Um, our agencies did just a phenomenal job of hosting the clinics, but there's a lot of lift that happened before then um, during a global pandemic as well. So we didn't get to like pause any of our other screening and monitoring or any of those. This was an additional thing on top of that. So um, navigating our different partners through pharmacies or um, public health. Okay, who uses this consent form? You need this in triplicate. What do we need to bring for this? There was just a lot of logistics that happened with that. Um, so we learned a lot and have the benefit as being a large organization to um, share those lessons across our agencies to, um, to, to learn and do things a little bit uh, more efficiently as time has gone on. So the other thing with our workforce is that we did need to employ different strategies for employees than for our contractors at different points in time. Um, in some states, uh, the contract model isn't necessarily recognized the same as the employee model when it came to where someone falls in the phases. So our local agencies did a lot of advocacy to help um, determine essential worker status. So next slide, please. So what's next? And I know we'll have lots of time to continue to talk about this. Um, as, as Ashley and Christy shared, the CDC guidance is shifting um, and we have to continue to shift with that. At Mosaic, we are continuing, whether you're vaccinated or not, uh, we continue to wear masks, we continue with our screening and monitoring. Um, prior to coming into your shift, those sorts of things. Um, it, it does bring some additional complications too, not only with our workforce, but with people served in terms of rights and privacy and, and those sorts of things. So um, 
there's plenty left to learn how to navigate um, as we as, as we continue through this vaccination process. Um, somebody shared on, on an internal mosaic call that we had a couple of weeks ago when we're talking about vaccinations and when do we open offices and you know we had a parent who said I only want vaccinated to staff to work with my person in their group home, but I don't want my child to get vaccinated, but I want their staff to be, I mean, it just gets really complicated. So somebody, somebody used the phrase that the lockdown was the easy part, unlocking and getting back to um, quote unquote normal is the challenge. And we know that we're going to continue to have to uh, use our critical thinking and navigate as, as the world um, shifts, but we are just taking every day as it as it comes, celebrating where we can, learning where we must, and uh, going from there. So, Kim, I'm going to give it back to you. Thank you, Jen, and, and I think you're right on. We're just learning every day and through challenges, and having all of you on this panel today, it really helps the rest of us kind of figure out what do we need to do, where are some areas we need to look at and really pay attention to. So again, I'm so happy that you're here with us. Now, um, just some questions, of course. Uh, you, we've been, we've spoken before, so you know I always have a ton of questions. So I'd really like to uh, get through that. Um, uh, sort of start. So were there any um, issues or concerns, maybe, Chris, you can talk about this, with your leadership team about the vaccine rollout? Did you have to have those discussions kind of behind the, behind the scene? People who were, I don't know about vaccines, maybe I do. And how did you address or resolve those? Well, I can tell you that, just to disclose, my entire executive team is vaccinated. Um, they did all make that choice. Uh, we really didn't have a lot of, of discord amongst the executives. I can tell you we were all on the same page um, as to when we got vaccinated. It was different times because I think, you know, I agree with Jen, you know, you're you're leading by example, but we really tried to get our, our staff that was the most critically exposed first, and then we threw executives in here and there. You know, we just kind of tossed that we sprinkled us about so we could be, uh, because the, the comment came up by one executive is, if you, if, if we all go down what's gonna to happen to the organization. So we were trying to make sure we were vaccinating a few executives here and there. Um, but really we were very united in that. And more than anything, I think the the process of how the ease, the ease of the process that we made for our employees, uh, and we we did vaccinate some of our, our group home uh, residents as well, but it, it was, it was I say it was easy, but there was a lot of back end work. Like I did a lot of work on it and my HR department did a lot of work on it. But the end user ease of the process has really, um, I think, got us to the numbers we're at today. So all that back end work kind of made the process easier for the end user, but there was a lot behind there. Yes. Yeah. And then, and Asha, oh, how about for some of us. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. That, that actually is one of my questions. So I'll get back to that. And, and Asha, how about for your team members, your staff members? Were, do you, did you find, like, I think Jen said, a lot of the team members were more hesitant maybe than some of your clients. Did you find that true also? We did. Um, I mean, as, you, as we mentioned right now, we have a 75% rate, which is pretty high. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the challenges that we had though was even though um, we shortened the window of time from the time that they opted in in the survey to say, I want to get the vaccine from the short time frame to get them to the person that was administrating the vaccine or the agency, that was short. And we had to make sure it was short because you did have people that were in that gray area. Um, but more so what came up was, um, for me, was a lot of people that either had underlying conditions, uh, medical conditions, they were pregnant or had been, um, had previously uh, actually had COVID-19. So <clears throat> those were the main things that came up for reasons that um, they were hesitant. And so in that time, it, it was good for us to hear that um, because it wasn't that they didn't want to get it, they just needed more information. And so in those cases, we definitely, you know, encourage them more than anything to start having those discussions with their medical teams, um, their personal medical teams, because we certainly didn't want to make, um, because we didn't mandate the vaccine uh, for our employees when we haven't yet. Um, that's just something that we could encourage them to do so that they can make that decision in their near future. But um, to answer your question, those are those were the main themes that came up um, around hesitancy. I didn't, we didn't have a lot of staff that, that just didn't want it. And I love your concept. I think you mentioned that when sometimes when staff would come to you, you would just pull up the CDC website right then and kind of look at it with them, 
and role model how they could do that themselves. I thought that was a great idea. Um, Jen, how about were, were your board members involved at all in any of this? Did you keep them informed or how did they play in? Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, we, have, we have a great board. They are um, definitely involved. Um, it was with our COVID core team, we really did a lot of the operational work, recommendations, those sorts of things. So the keeping the board, of course, in, in the know as all of those things happen. So it wasn't necessarily an approval as much as here's our plan, have we missed anything, are you okay with our approach, this is what we're doing. So it was um, it was really collaborative more than approval, I guess, if you will. Sure, and how about for you, Christy, with the HN? Same, so we, we give our board updates every month on um, our bridge back process, how many we've had vaccinated. Um, board was Our board was very um, supportive of our process, and then we've just recently passed a vaccination policy, a mask policy, and then also we have a declination form if you, you know, if somebody refuses to wear a mask. And I mean that there's a lot of, you know, moving parts around that to where it could, depending on their exposure, I mean, we could say, well, you're no longer able to do this job because it's too risky. So there was a lot of conversation and luckily we had experts on our board that uh, contributed to the development of the, the policies, which we really appreciated. And I think you all have, you're all still wearing masks, whether you're vaccinated or not, right? At each of your agencies, is that right? Correct. Everybody's yeah. still wearing masks on that? Great. And then will you go over again how you're maintaining and how you're uh, monitoring new staff that come in or maybe staff who weren't vaccinated before, now they're getting vaccinated, how you're maintaining that or monitoring that? Is that part of your new hire process for new staff? Can yeah. You go over I'll more time, please. Yeah, I'll jump in and, and go first on this one. Um, and it's funny because I think Ashley, you just mentioned a little bit ago that um, is a short time frame. People needed to sign up if they're ready for a clinic, and and we found that too. But it never failed. Like the clinic was yesterday, and then five employees were like, "Okay, so when's the next clinic?" And we're like, "We do not know when that is." So um, it is this sort of ongoing operationalization of when we make those things available to folks. So um, yeah, so that's really now part of our, our new hire process based on regionally what phases or what is available. Uh, we've had great partnerships with pharmacies or other, um, other local places to build that in as we're getting new folks, but we still have a good chunk of, I mean, we're probably not even at 50% of our full workforce that's vaccinated yet. So we're still playing catch up um, across our states because it's just in varying phases of, of availability. So wanting to make it part of our, our initial process is the desire, just not fully there yet. Okay. And, and that, yeah, what we've done is we luckily have a great partnership with our county hospital. They are one of our sponsoring agencies. So they, they appoint board members and they have a very large, um, you know, they're very invested in, in the organization. So we've been able to send lists over to our county hospital with new employees that want to get vaccinated. And so we've been able to turn those around pretty quickly. Uh, what we are doing, we are gonna, we are asking new hires, have you been vaccinated and asking for uh, proof? and keeping that on file because we do feel like uh, it's important for us to know as we decide to go back into the office. And plus, um, as you know, CDC guidelines change uh, with regards to vaccinated versus unvaccinated, we wanna make sure we have the right um, precautions in place for, for each group. Right, absolutely. It's so interesting too to hear both agencies, once a multi-state, once a same state, and the different challenges that you each have had. It's, it's really an interesting plan like that. Um, how about the budget? What's been the budget impact on tracking all this, setting all this up, ongoing monitoring? Can you talk a little bit about that? Anybody, just jump on it. Talk to Ashley. She's our she's our our finance guru. She can she can tackle that one for us. Great. So um, our our fiscal year starts in September. Uh, we run on a federal fiscal year. So um, what we did was we. We began um, our first quarter, we took a 25% uh, budget reduction in revenue because um, although we had the ability to conduct services, uh, you know, in different ways via remote, through a telephone or through, um, you know, video, 
we definitely wanted to be conservative in our approach um, because, I mean, we obviously know that the volume was not going to be uh, as it was when we were in person or we had expected that. So we did take a 25% reduction there. Uh, the other thing though that we did have to account for that was different obviously was um, invest a lot more in PPE, cleaning supplies, and Christy touched on the fact that um, as, a, as an executive team, we created a strategy that we called, you know, a bridge back um, process. And really what that did was it had us um, look at each facility and say, what, what, does, what do these facilities need to take in certain precautions? So whether it was plexiglass at the reception areas, whether it was adding, um, you know, stickers to the floor to, to uh, showcase that the, there was six feet apart between uh, people that were using those facilities, um, having enough PPE available to all the staff that had to use that facility. Um, and then, uh, so it was taking into consideration all of, all of those costs that, you know, we hadn't initially planned for. So we had to make sure that um, we had definitely enough in PPE that we were monitoring, and we still do on a daily basis um, with respect to who we have in person. So with regards to the budget, that was really the extent um, that we took into consideration for our operations and then of course uh, our facilities and our employees needs on PPE. And then just real quick, I'll add is we, um, if an employee was either diagnosed with COVID and needed time off or if they um, went to get their vaccine, we did not charge them their PTO. We allowed that to be an administrative cost. Uh, we felt to support them, especially our frontline staff and our like in our observation units and our crisis units that were exposed. We we gave them the time off, but then we also gave everyone the time off to get the vaccine and if they needed, you know, a, a day to to recover if there was any adverse reaction. So that we didn't budget that, but we've been okay as far as being able to accommodate those those uh, those needs or requests. Nice. And Jen, I'm wondering about all the logistics you talk about, multi-state and forms and triplicate and consent forms and all that stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me, it had to be a slight budget impact, not a larger one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and looking at the different funding structures and mechanisms across 13 states is 13 different oh. ways, right? So, um, gosh, PPE, certainly there's a whole new appreciation for PPE and what we have available and how much we're spending on that and what we can access. Um, we had budgetary impact on things like uh, COVID differentials, if there was an outbreak at a location or those sorts of things. Um, and then more so with the vaccinations is really trying to, there was a, a lot in terms of the logistics to try to get the clinics and those sorts of things set up, but really trying to capture what that adds moving forward to be able to budget for the vaccination process um, or people missing work because of that. So um, gathering data, adjusting and shifting, but also a ton of work at each state regarding their funding mechanisms. In some states we saw um, some relief funding for, for those services and other states we did not. So really counting on our advocacy with our local leaders and our, our, our local folks to really let, um, let the stories be heard. I mean, the pandemic's been challenging on everyone and you know, everyone felt, felt it in different ways, but really helping those stories be told and those voices be heard. Um, and I think each of your agencies had uh, like a COVID core team to help figure some of this stuff out. Is that true? You each had like a group of people, the, like a steering committee. Not that you did all the work, but you were kind of designing the plan. Is that right or did I get that wrong? We did. Yeah. Yeah. We have a cross-departmental team, yeah. Our executive team really served as that because we actually have a daily huddle every morning. We're on a video call. And so when, you know, when positive cases really spiked in El Paso, when we were one of the top cities in the nation, you know, we were discussing things every single day. And then as that switched to the vaccine rollout, we were discussing things every single day. So my, my executive team, like I said, we huddle every morning and those, the, the vaccine rollout when we were doing it was, it consumed a, a big chunk of that time to make sure it was done correctly. And, and then Jenny, you said you had your, your, your team too? Yeah, so, um, you know, we have, each of our states has a, a vice president of operations. They kind of do things their way. 
not their way, it's the mosaic way, but there are subtle enough differences. So when the pandemic first started to create a way to gather data across the entire um, enterprise, a, a group of us came together, kind of a steering committee is probably a, a better phrase for it or word for it. It was um, interdepartmental. We did, gosh, daily standups for the first, I don't know how long we did three times a week bulletins to try to get information out. But we have a health services director who really was our clinical person who got all of the um, CDC information. Um, I was our operational person who put our, our guidance together. We had HR, we had um, a, a group of folks who really tried to per, um, create those resources to, to make available to our, our agencies and our states. So yeah, it's, and you used the phrase daily stand-up. Would you explain that a little bit more? Yes, sometimes we had a few. So uh, for the first, I don't know how many months at four o'clock every day, we talked about here's the state of mosaic. Here's the number of positive cases. Um, and then smaller groups of us would have stand-ups three times a week to talk about our workforce or to talk about uh, um, other things. We really found we had to establish quickly a cadence of communication both internally within our steering committee as well as externally. Um, for about six months, we had a, a daily bulletin Monday through Friday that we would put out that had any changed guidance or any updates with CDC or we created a enterprise-wide PPE tracker that you go in so we can have a count of your PPE at any given time. So pretty quickly we had to um, organize to create a way to get information from the 13 states and then get that information back out to them to figure out what resources and things were needed. So right. And how about now? Um Christy, how do you keep track of and follow making sure you're current on the CDC guidelines? Our, uh, I think Ashley alluded to this. We have a, a chief nursing officer who is also a nurse practitioner. And then we have our chief, we have two chief medical officers. We have one over primary care and addiction and one over um, behavioral health and IDD. So our primary care CMO and our, our CNO are on top. I mean, they're constantly reporting to that, us to that. We, we discuss that every day, any changes, uh, anything we need to shift for. And then um, all PPEs at the beginning, and she still monitors, but as we were purchasing PPE, whether it uh, was a mask or cleaner, she was uh, required to review and approve those to make sure they met CDC guidelines. So we were, you know, not wasting money on things that, you know, there was a lot of counterfeit, a lot of things out there with the N95s. And so we were making sure we were getting the right stuff. Wow. And how about that you, Jen? Was, I was just going to jump in. That was also an interesting, um, it's so interesting to be in a number of states to see the approach being different. And you know, in, in some states, the state requirement for if there was an outbreak or the requirement for PPE was an N95 mask and an apron. And then one state over, they also required the hair bouffant and the shoe covers. And then one state over from that, like, hey, if you wear a mask, that's pretty cool. So <laughs> it's just very interesting to navigate. CDC guidance is really what directed most things. But then when you'd have to navigate through some of those local um, or licensure specific, so ICFID versus waiver versus, you know, those sorts of things. Um, really having our experts keyed in to where to find those those right answers or what that guidance was, we found to be really important. And who's doing that on an ongoing basis for you, Jen? So our health services director and our steering committee is really still monitoring that. Um, I mean, you can sign up for 400 alerts a day to let you know when a PPE requirement has changed or those sorts of things. Um, that for a long period of time was going into each state portal to find what those updates are. States got um, more user friendly and that they got then to a point where they kick that out to you if you're on a mailing list. So it was pretty time consuming for a real long time. That's what I was thinking and that all that also has um budgetary impact. But I think when you're working in a nonprofit, we kind of get used to one more thing we have to do on any given day, right? But it still takes you time away that you would normally be doing other things. Um, Christy, I love the term bridging back. Is that, or Ashley, we talked about that too, I think, the bridging back philosophy. Who came up with that? I, I like that term. So not reopening or going back to work, the bridging back. 
You know, I think I swiped it from a seminar or something I was listening to. I can't remember because what the conversation was at the time. Mind it seminar. was just... probably open minds. I will give credit to Joseph Martin Travers. Okay. <laughs> was like, don't, don't work with us on a lot of projects. No, I, I, it was probably an open minds conversation. But, um, what uh, what we found is, you know, when you talk about return to work, you know, six months ago, people were afraid and, and you know, the, the new normal and returning to normalcy. And I think to, you know, I guess, I don't know if it's the social worker in me or what, I just felt like that just, you know, wasn't what we wanted to convey to our staff. So what we did is we, we called it a bridge back because it is very different. Even once, you know, people are vaccinated, it is going to be a different world. You know, we're just deciding who's going to remain remote, who's going to do hybrid. We've repurposed facilities during this time. And Ashley said we've also modified facilities. So this whole bridge back plan has been an ongoing process. And it, it started with a video that I did to all the staff assuring them, you know, and I think one of the things we were super proud of is we didn't lay off a single person. We, we actually hired every month during the pandemic. And so I think we're assuring and reassuring people was part of our bridge back. So we really touched every single, if you think of a bridge and the pillars that hold up a bridge, you know, we were really trying to build those pillars as we were paving the bridge to make sure our staff was very, um, they felt supported and they were comfortable. And, uh, and as we, you know, we went into budget and being prepared financially as one of those pillars and so there's just so many different things that you have to do to make sure everybody's comfortable walking over that bridge to come back. What a great concept. Ashley anything to add to that? No as Christy mentioned I mean we looked at so many things we looked at personnel that was a separate category on its own as part of our bridge back. Um, we looked at billing. We looked at um, building strategies which is what we've talked about a lot today. Um, <clears throat> And then I think the other thing that we started talking a lot about was uh, operations and PPE. So those were like our five main areas because they each needed their own separate level of attention because we couldn't, it was too massive to treat it all as one. And so we kind of, that helped us as an executive team was really separating that out, um, identifying people that could lead certain things and then just getting status updates, um, you know, and making sure that it was in line with, you know, the CDC guidelines and then any guidelines that we had here locally. If I could just add, Kim, one of the other things that we did during our bridge back is we took the employees back in small groups and trained them on their facility. So they would, they did walkthroughs with with a, a leader that was part of the bridge back team and um, actually saw their clinic, what was modified, where the PPEs were, you know, cleaning cloths, all that good stuff. And we took them back in small groups and we did a survey afterwards we did a pre-survey saying how did people feel about returning and then we did a post-survey after everyone did their bridge back training and people's level of anxiety was just reduced as far as they, they were able to see what what things were going to look like great idea and jen how about for you when you were when you were bringing people back what kind of the processes that you were going through yeah so um well we're still building that bridge <laughs> i like your bridge back uh, you know, it started really with um, more incidental or situational things. We created a risk assessment for people that we support. So folks who wanted to, like fresh out of the lockdown, people who wanted to return to a whatever. Uh, so we created a, an individual risk assessment process to help the person's team develop what their level of risk might be based on any health complexities or the environment or those sorts of things. So that was very situational. Um, we're now at the point where we're looking at, uh, we refer to it more as reintegration. So reintegration back into any of our offices. We do have um, some of our states reintegrated uh, their day programs or their day services in the last couple of months um, in a phased in sort of approach. Um, that was also interesting to see where the states were very different. Some states were like, nope, don't even talk about getting back to day services, whereas the state right next to you might be like, I can't believe you didn't open already, like everyone else opened a month ago. And um, so anyway, so our reintegration plans have really been more focused around phasing folks in and using those individual risk assessments to help the team make kind of that decision for the person served. But then Mosaic, um, we've created templates on, on here's some checklists and things you want to um, um, 
have in mind before we're looking at opening. So, you know, we start at 25% and for a month at 25%, you know, staff back in the office, what tells us that we can go to 50%? What if you have an outbreak and kind of all of those contingencies. So a lot of templates, a lot of planning and a lot of just critical thinking and talking through. I mean, we could, I am a form person and a template person. We could make a beautiful form that hit maybe 70% of our situations because the other 30% had those nuances that just weren't captured in that. So it's really a lot of our local agency leadership and critical thinking to see what's best for what's happening there. Yeah, that's great. I know you all mentioned some modifications you made to your facilities. Anything particular, can you share some of that with us? Yeah, go ahead. I'll let Ashley go ahead and because she let a lot of that down. Sure. Yeah, I think um, just because Jen just mentioned it too, one of the things that we did right away was um, we actually pulled uh, building capacities for each location. Uh, what we did was we labeled also um, professionally labeled those buildings every floor with the maximum capacity at 25, 50, 75, and 100 percent. So that staff themselves were not waiting on management um, to tell them, you know, what those numbers were. So we felt like, again, information is power. We were going to be really transparent about. Oops, I think we might have gotten, she might have been frozen. Do you want to finish that thought for us, Christy? Sure, yes. sure. We were just very transparent about you know what uh, what we could and couldn't do i think that's what she was trying to get at so i think people were felt better knowing you know there's buildings we didn't know what the capacity restraints were you know as far as 100 percent. so i think that really was the best um first step to getting people comfortable then we went in and we looked at our areas uh for plexiglass you know with nurses stations and um uh desks uh receptionist desks things like that stickers we made professional stickers that had our logo on it you know we made sure everything was very professionally done uh and then the other thing was really labeling and everybody knowing exactly where ppe was you know where it was stored where they could get it um we never had anybody reusing ppe we always were able to issue them new um new masks every day or whatever the the standard was for that particular item great and jen how about you yeah so we had kind of a combination between since we you know a, a lot of what we do is the 24 residential services um not a lot of necessarily modifications to group homes or those sorts of things it was really more the like i'll take you back a year where's all the toilet paper where's all the clorox wipes like how do we get those things so that supply and demand as well as um you know the ppe of course but um you know is it okay to have Domino's drop a pizza at my front door so those sorts of things um but really the other piece of it for our administrative folks i mean closing our offices was fairly easy uh our it department was tremendous in the scramble to find equipment for people to be able to work at home and that was a huge lift that um I mean, you know, I remember there was a wait list for no one could get the cameras, like the little cameras, and it's like, okay, what are we going to do? We're on a wait list. Amazon is sold out. So a lot of pivoting to try to find those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a scramble. It was. Any other um, like facility modifications you had to make, Jen, or come to Not mind? Really, yeah. In, in addition to kind of what Ashley and, and Christy shared with like marking off, here's here's six feet. We did have um, uh, some, in some locations before we opened them or where there was an outbreak, uh, did some research and hired some professional companies to come and disinfect and um, do those sorts of things um, just to, to make sure that, you know, we've gone above and beyond in any of those sanitation sorts of things. Sure. Well, I if I can just add real quick to that, Kim, thank you. And I, it's another plug for Open Minds. Um, we had done strategic planning with Open Minds, you know, several years ago. I think we're on our second three-year plan with Open Minds. But our first plan actually built our IT infrastructure and almost like we knew this was going to happen. So I can, I, I can feel uh, Jen's pain. I know some of my colleagues couldn't get cell phones. They couldn't get, you know, um, laptops. And I can tell you because of our strategic planning efforts, 
we had minimal disruption because every the, all of that infrastructure had been put into place already. We were already using Microsoft Teams before it was cool. You know, so we we had already started all of that thanks to some great strategic planning and for, forecasting. Well, the good thing about those strategic planning is even if you have a great plan, you have to implement it. So kudos for you all for implementing the plan, actually, not just putting it up on your shelf. Well done on that. I know we're um, down to about our last 10 minutes, but I want to give you both a chance to tell us what do you think your biggest lessons learned? If you had advice you wanted to give people who are just now getting ready to go back, what what is your advice? Jen, you want to start? Sure. Um... I think it's, you don't have to have all the answers. And that is really such a tough lesson, especially as a leader who has personally maybe some control issues. Like you don't have to have the cake fully baked. Um, and that feels a little uncomfortable, but sometimes you have to get out of the, get out of the trees and just look at the forest and, and weigh out what is the best situation for that team, that person, that location, and then support it in, in the best way that you can. And um, over the last year, uh, it's it's been a, kind of tremendous. The things that it felt like before the pandemic took forever to change. And when a pandemic happens, it can happen like that. So the other lesson is sometimes without knowing it, we become our biggest barriers. And if we could set those aside and just kind of figure out what needs to happen, um, that's I think shifted how we go about some of our approach to things now. So sort of being a little more gentle with yourself and you can only do what you can do. And then recognizing that, gosh, things can happen quicker than they could in the past. Imagine that. We don't need 14 committee meetings to figure that out. Look at that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering how long that will last. It'll be interesting, won't it? <laughs> and, and Christy, what, you, what are your lessons learned? What advice you want to give to folks? Well, I think the main lesson I learned is right along with Jen is, you know, you, you can't change the world, you know, on your own. So I think one of the, the main lessons I I really learned, and, and it's like I knew, but I, I didn't uh, recognize it, is the fact of how critical our, our services are in our community. Um, our, and, and that if, if we started to trip or, or fall, that it would have a snowball effect in our community. And our leaders realized that too. And the calls that I got from the mayor, from my congresswoman, uh, from all of our elected officials saying, how are you? How are you doing? How's the organization doing? You know, I really felt, wow, you know, I think we need to celebrate that more. And so that's one of the things I think Jen nailed is celebrating the day. You know, if you accomplish it, celebrate it. And I think we're doing more of that, even though we're not together. I think we're recognizing our successes and our, our uh, the, the critical piece that we play in our community. And what I've really tried to do and as a leader is share that across my organization. I may get the call from the mayor. And if I don't do anything with that information, the rest of my staff doesn't get to celebrate that. So I think it was really important for me to communicate the, the successes. We're always trying to put out fires and we're always trying to overcome the next hurdle, but, but really celebrating and allowing the staff to fill that as well, I think was a big lesson for me. Absolutely. I mean, this whole pandemic, the COVID pandemic really put so much stress on all of us on any given day. So finding those ways to celebrate and how we can celebrate, I think that's a great, right. you know, great lesson also. Yay, Ashley came back, great. Um, Ashley, we're Sorry just, no, well, it happens. Um, we were just talking about if you had a piece of advice or two pieces of advice that you want to give our audience on how to deal with kind of the bridge back or re reintegration back, what would it be? Not to put you on the spot, you just came in. <laughs> I, I think, um... For me, the biggest lesson that I've learned is being patient. Um, I usually am somebody that likes to control as much as I can. Um, so I do that through a lot of planning. And so I think just being patient has been something that I've definitely been able to take away. Oh, that's a great lesson every day, isn't it? That patience thing. That's the theme of the, the webinar, Kim, is patience for the control freaks. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. Patience. Not easy. Can... <laughs> We can do it and to forgive ourselves right when things aren't when the cake is not fully baked it's still going to be okay we're going to we're going to go through that okay any final thoughts i know we, we have about six minutes left i know corey's got a, a couple of announcements for us but um any last thoughts things you want to share 
for today? You know, all I would say is, you know, not just we're very uh, connected with open minds. I want to tell that I think our networks, whether it was open minds or my my statewide networks, I think kudos to how we all came together and supported each other. I could make a call to Gettysburg or I could make a call to a, a colleague in Alabama and say, what are you doing to address this? And I, I mean, everybody just came together and really supported another one another. So kudos to Open Minds for everything you've put out, all the information and the continued support that you're providing um, the, the industry. So I just wanna thank you for that. Well, that's very nice of you, thank you. I, I know I'll, I'll make sure Monica watches this uh, recording so she can hear that. Good. Any, anyone else, final thoughts? I just might add to that. I, I agree. And I think the, the trick during the pandemic and, and then and beyond wherever we're going with vaccination is you don't have the luxury to turn off your day to day business. So continuing with the, the strategic planning, the information, the partnership, those sorts of things in a way that like we still we still have to put one foot in front of the other and navigate both worlds at the same time. Um, I just think like this too shall pass. We like we'll we'll get there. We'll do that. So I think you know open minds and our partners leading the charge with yep we still have a business to run. We'll get that information there. But also, how can we? What else do you need? How can we fill some of those gaps that you've maybe found? So it's been really helpful. Monica often uses the phrase um, you have to paddle two canoes. And that's, certainly we did that during the the pandemic. And Ashley, any final words from you? No, I think, like I said, um, for me, it's, it's just been, um, it's been ever changing. And so it's, it's always evolving. And I think that, you know, knowledge is key, it's power. And so, you know, I think that as much as you can push it out to your staff, the, the better off you'll be um, so that they also know how to locate resources when they're not available. Great, thank you. Well, um, we at Open Minds are so thankful for the work that you do, and we're so proud and honored that we get to support you and help you in any way that we can through not just this time, but through all the things that go on in behavioral health, social services, especially with our nonprofit. So thank you for letting us be part of this. And thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all this wisdom and experience that you've had. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. I can't wait to uh, talk to you again. Hopefully someday you'll be face to face again, live to live. And then, uh, Corey, you have some closing remarks for us? Thank you. Yes, all. I do. Yes, I do, Kim. Thank you very much. I also want to thank Christy, Jen, and Ashley for coming on today. And I would like to uh, remind everybody that we are here every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Next week, we'll be here for Debbie Cagle, Chief Marketing Officer for Centerstone. She will talk about cautionary virtual tales, transformational lessons learned for call center operations in a pandemic. And while we're talking about executive web forms, I want to remind everybody on our front page if you go under events, for executive web forums, you will find a list of all the upcoming executive forums as well as a complete library of our on-demand resources. And I wanna take one final moment to plug uh, through April 12th, our resources from our recent Technology and Analytics Institute are available at the top of our site. If you go to recordings, under each session, there will be a recording and anybody who attended the event or is an elite member can access those there. Once again, I want to thank everybody else. Kim? Thank you all very much, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Bye, Bye all. Thank you.